you will open your Bibles uh, or your apps to 1 Corinthians 15. We're looking at verses 12 to 22 this morning. And just want to recognize we, you know, we have young ones in here, we, and that's great. Um, not a big deal if they make noises. It's part of like family life. If you have a bunch of people over to your house and there's kids running around, is anyone surprised when they make noise? No. Um, and so that's not, the, that's freedom from any condemnation if your kids are making noise. Like just, <laughs> just, just enjoy uh, the fact that they're alive, you know, and that like it is, it's a stewardship and it's awesome. So that's, uh, let's get into the text and I'll try to make this, um, I'm not going to make any promises. Anyway. So I have a question for you. Uh, do you ever wonder if what you're doing in your life is worth it? You ever have that thought? Maybe you came here today and you're wondering what you're doing in life is worth the trouble, worth the hassle, worth the pain that it takes to get where you are. Have you ever been in a place in life where you worked hard for something and it never really panned out the way you had hoped? Or maybe the, the way that you had been promised? Or maybe like we saw Paul last week, if you were here in Acts, we saw Paul get bitten by a viper. He had been rescued from a boat, shipwrecked in the sea, gets ashore, and they're like, finally, I can relax, start a fire, snake jumps out of the fire and bites him on the hand. And it's like, are you serious? Come on. Maybe you went to give a friend a hug and ended up losing your balance and face planting on the gravel. These are just ideas that I came up with. I don't know. Maybe things were going along normally, and then you end up in the hospital for several days. We love you, Paige. Hope to see you soon. Maybe you have a business, and you had built it up, and you're working on things. Things are going along, and someone drives their car into the front door. I don't know. Does that happen? Any of those things happen to somebody this week? Tim, you're going to raise your hand. You might have seen the news story. Things like that can cause any normal person to question key aspects of their life. Moments of interruption like that give us a sense of insecurity and make us feel powerless. But what they really are, are moments when we see things as they truly are. Right? We are utterly powerless and not in any way in control of things. All those, those moments in life, what they really reveal to us is whatever semblance of security and comfort and control that we had in our lives, it's facade. And it can be crashed through just like Tim's, I'm not, that's the last reference to Tim's story. I wish they had gotten to the pool. I know you don't, but anyway. Think about this for a minute. We're utterly powerless, and all of us know this inherently. Like, any, anything that we do to try and, you know, satisfy ourselves or distract ourselves or create a sense of control in our lives, that's all, re like, it's all in, in response to the utter helplessness we feel. And if you think about it, almost all the marketing and sales in our culture is geared to try and sell you something that promises to bring you the fulfillment that you want. They're offering a cure for the felt need that we all have. It's trying to cure this lack of power and control that we all at moments realize to some degree or another. Now, all of us know if you have a health problem, it's important to get a correct diagnosis before looking for a cure, right? Because at the root of every health issue is a cause, and that must be addressed to actually fix the problem. There's many things that we can do to mask pain or relieve symptoms, but the root cause, if it's never addressed, the treatment is in vain. Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is the promise and the fulfillment from God that those who are in Christ have their greatest need 
dealt with, and they can live in a sense of, of understanding that they have no power and control because they trust in the one who has complete control and power over their life and has given himself for them. It's the promise from God that those who are in him will not, li- will not live lives of vanity. So this Easter morning, the question I want to pose to you is this. What difference does the resurrection make? Like, would it change anything about our faith if the resurrection was a myth perpetuated by Christians over the past 2,000 years or so? I saw a tweet. I'm not on Twitter, but I saw a meme that takes a picture of a tweet. You know what it is. From a woman named Serene Jones, who's the president of Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Based on her comments, I would not advise anyone look into that. But she said this. She said, Happy Easter. You can believe in resurrection without believing in a bodily resurrection. Faith is more than adherence to rigid dogma. You can believe in a resurrection, in in resurrection without believing in a bodily resurrection. Faith is more than adherence to rigid dogma. Again, don't go to that seminary. So here's the question I want to ask. What if she's right? Does it, not, does it really not matter whether Jesus was actually bodily raised from the dead? Does it matter? Historically. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You should all know that. But why? Right? I know, I know I'm talking, preaching to the choir here. But, but I think it's good because... All of us at some point will see self-proclaimed Christians who will say things like this woman said here. They, they come from this modernist idea. Well, well, in the you know, 30s and so, people started having this modern idea, and they, were, they started throwing out all the supernatural, miraculous things in Scripture. Well, the virgin birth couldn't really happen because that's un, it's not scientifically possible. So we're going to throw that out. Right? And, then, and then comes the resurrection. Well, people don't rise from the dead because they don't rise from the dead. So we're going to throw that out and we're going to make some theological gymnastic type thing to try to make resurrection be something more than resurrection. But we need to be understand. We need to be equipped to know why it matters. Why does it matter? Let's, let's read this text because Paul has a lot to say about this question. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12. We're going to reference other parts of this, but we're just focusing on this text. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Sound familiar? It's not a new, it's not a new question, right? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who, also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, and by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. 
the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection to, under him, that God may be all in all. Let's pray and ask God to help us understand, apply, and worship because of this text. Lord, I come to you this morning and I ask for your help. I trust that you are moving because your word does not return void. Lord, we need you. Lord, I pray that you would help us, not just to learn information this morning, but Lord, that our hearts would be nurtured, that our affections would be increased for you, and that you would magnify yourself in your word and in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a real quick overview. We don't normally just jump into texts like this. I feel like I've said that a lot lately because we've kind of done it some lately. But the Apostle Paul is writing one of two letters that we have access to that were sent to the church in Corinth. Paul was writing them to clarify and correct some areas where this church had really gotten some stuff wrong. There was a lot of divisions in the church, a lot of sexual immorality, and even some people getting drunk at communion. All right, there was a lot messed up for sure in this church. Um, so Paul had a lot of things to address with them. One of those errors that was being spread was that there was no such thing as the resurrection from the dead, right? It's probably some Sadducees got in the church, right? Because they don't believe in resurrection. They don't believe in angels or spirits. Not only, um, not only that, this error, if left, oh, I'm sorry, Paul must address this error. If there are errors circulating within the church, especially one that's so foundational to the faith, he's got to address it. And if it goes unchecked and unaddressed, this could cause some serious damage to the church. And I would argue that this error, unaddressed in, in certain streams of Christianity, has caused great damage to the church. So let's think about this for a moment. What, what kind of damage happens when we neglect our belief in Christ's resurrection? and therefore our own resurrection. It makes, it makes your Christianity, it makes everything that you believe about God, it makes it about this life only. Right? It takes this eternal perspective that God offers in Scripture, and it brings it down to this tiny little period of time. And it makes everything that you do about that. I see this happen a couple different ways. People are so focused on this life, what happens in the streams and in, in different places, they're so focused on this life, all they want to do is, is help alleviate people's needs in this life, and they're never concerned with sharing the gospel. They want to do all kinds of, of projects and things like that. Not that those are bad, but what happens is they get so focused on social things that they forget, they leave out, they think that the message of Jesus is just to make people's lives good here. Another way that this happens, people are get so focused on this life that they are crushed when their hopes for this life are unfulfilled. The way I see it, either way, it can have devastating effects on the church. Essentially, they're focused on the first 75 years of eternity. That's like putting all of your hopes on the first play of a football game, right? Or it's trying to find all your enjoyment in the first note of a song. Or basing your relationship with ch your child on the first few seconds of their life. It makes no sense at all, does it? At the same time, if there is no resurrection, then it makes no sense to follow Christ. Paul makes it clear that following Christ only makes sense if there's a resurrection. This is why I think it was, is acceptable, maybe not right here in this moment, to mock people who say 
you can believe in resurrection and not bodily resurrection. They're ridiculous. Like, we should be pitying them. What I want to do now is, is look briefly, look at Paul lo- Paul's logic as he corrects this error that's going on. So the first thing that we see is this. If Christ is not raised from the dead, he's, he's following their logic. They're saying, all right, there's no resurrection. He's saying if there's no resurrection, Christ is not raised. And do you see where Paul goes? If Christ is not raised from the dead, there is no atonement for sin. If Christ is just a person who came to teach valuable lessons to people about how to live and how to love people and how to care for, you know, be good, but he actually was just dead and was not raised, Paul says you are still dead in your sins. Your faith is futile and you are still in your sin, verse 17. Think about that for a moment. That's where Paul goes. You can kind of see Paul's Paul's priority as he makes the argument. His priority is if Christ is not raised, you're still dead in your sins. That means there is no atonement for sins. The first problem with denying the resurrection of Christ is to deny the need for an accomplishment of the atonement. We spent our time, Good Friday service, meditating on the atonement and confessing the sins that made it necessary. If Christ is not raised from the dead, that was all in vain. Going further with this, if Christ is not raised from the dead, this this verse 17, you're still in your sins. This points back to verse 3 of this chapter. For I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. To understand and believe the gospel, you must recognize your need for your sins to be dealt with. That feeling that we all have of reality, that we all know something's broken, that we're all longing for something, that's a result of our sin. That's a result of our rejection of God. And the only way that we can make that right is by trusting in his finished work. The only way that we can have atonement is through the blood of Christ and his resurrection. This points back to my opening statement about having a correct diagnosis for a health problem. We see the evidence of this fall all around us. We don't have to look far to see the brokenness in our world, do we? It's everywhere, and the world knows it. That's what's being leveraged to sell you all manner of goods and services. That's what's driving people who are going through normal trials of puberty to decide that their problem is not that they're going through the normal trials of puberty and they need something. Their problem is this, no, I was born into the wrong body. Again, trying to take control, trying to have a semblance of control over what they are recognizing is their lack of control. It's what drives married people to seek satisfaction outside of their marriage on computer screens and on real life. It's what drives some people to to pursue wealth to the point where they alienate their family because they're so fixated on trying to control and trying to have security in what they have. All of that is trying to remove the curse on their own, but it's only for a moment and it leads to disaster. Because you see, the symptoms that we have of our brokenness cannot be cured with any earthly goods or services or relationships or wealth. A new car, a new house, a new name, a new spouse will never remove the mark of sin. It's a curse that we inherited from our first parents. Furthermore, it's not something that just makes us unhappy. It's something that makes us worthy of God's wrath. And the only thing that could remove that wrath 
was for Christ to bear the full weight of it on the cross. That's why the atonement is so important. It is, it is this, the creator God who, who made all things and made this creation so that he, they might share in his love. That creation rejected it. Said, nope, I think we'll figure this out on our own. He didn't just write them off. He actually made a way for them to be reconciled. And that was through the death of Christ on the cross. That's why Paul says, if there's no resurrection, those who have fallen asleep have perished. He goes on to say, if, if we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. I know I've said this a lot in here. If you've been here for a while, you've heard me say this, but I think this is one of the most compelling arguments for the resurrection and the truth of the gospel. Basically, he's acknowledging the fact if Jesus actually, the historical Jesus was not historically raised from the dead bodily, and we're here saying all these things about him, if it didn't happen, we should be mocked and pitied and felt sorry for. He goes on to say later on in this chapter, in verse 32, he says, if there is no resurrection, what we should do is we should eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Dead or not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Paul, Paul was quoting one of their popular poets. I think Davidus, Matthewsicus. There's nothing new under the sun. It all comes around again, right? So that's if we, if we lose the resurrection. If the resurrection doesn't happen, we've lost the atonement. The second thing that happens if we lose the resurrection, we guarantee, we lose the guarantee of our resurrection. So if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, there's no atonement for sins, and we don't have anything to be looking forward to. Death is just the final end. If you look at verses 20 to 23. But in fact, if Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those belong to Christ. This is, this is a powerful, this goes back to that thing about, you know, judging the whole football game on the first play or, or enjoying a song. That, that note was great. Just the first note. It doesn't make sense. The promise of Christ is not the promise for this life. It's not the promise for the next 60 years or 20 years or 10 years or however many years we have left. It's a promise for eternity. That's a huge, bold claim. If you think about the, the, the claims of Christianity is that you can live forever. You can be raised from the dead. You can live a life in this body, and then they'll put it in the ground, and then someday it's going to actually come up. Like, think about that claim for a minute. Like, it doesn't make sense. Right? Unless somebody has done that. Unless at some point in time, the person who made these promises did what he promised to happen to you. And so the claim of Christ and the claim of Christianity, it's worthless if Christ actually wasn't raised from the dead. If he did, though, he's the first fruit of resurrection. So his resurrection proves that his sacrifice was sufficient for the forgiveness of sins. Think about this for a moment. And this is for, for those of you who are Christians who might struggle with your assurance of salvation. If you struggle with, I'm not really feeling connected to God. I'm doubting. I'm having struggling, whatever it might be. This is, this is the beauty of this. The proof of your forgiveness from sin is not something that can be assured by your own emotions. 
You hear what I'm saying there? Most of us, when we think about our assurance of our forgiveness from sin and the assurance of what's going to happen in the future, and do we really believe this? Is this a fairy tale or whatever? The proof that we have is entirely based on Christ's historical resurrection. Like, that to me, it takes, it takes the message of Christianity from something that seems like a fairy tale to actually something that's solid and actually has historical proof. Like this, that's, I've said this before, the, the beauty of the New Testament, the beauty of the things that we teach are they are, um, they are able to be verified in their time that they, was written, that they were written. There were people who had eyewitness accounts of Jesus's bodily resurrection. There were people who interacted with this risen Savior. And so from the very foundations of our faith, it was not about something that you just have to trust in, like the force, right? Or, or like some other thing where it just seems like a fairy tale. No, this was close. This was, this was, it was verifiable. And so that is the basis of the proof that we have, not our emotions, but we, we have is a risen Savior who historically rose on the third. I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of hope when I'm tempted to trust my emotions as my assurance for salvation. The proof of your forgiveness of sin is not something that can be assured by your emotions. It's assured by the fact of the resurrection. And his resurrection is simply the first of all who follow him. Here's the third thing we lose if we lose the resurrection. So we, we lose the atonement. We lose our resurrection. And if, if we lose the resurrection, we lose the second coming. When all will be made right and death will be totally swallowed up in victory. If you, we didn't read this, but if you flip over, if you have your Bible there, if you look at chapter or verses 50 to 56, I tell you this, brothers, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the perishable, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. What a promise. All of our bodies are so perishable. Who had evidence of that this week? This morning, as I've been preaching, my fingers are tingly. I'm like, I know I said we did mulch yesterday. I'm like, oh gosh, I tweaked something. You ever wake up sore? Teddy's never woke up sore. You're too young for that, Teddy. Sorry. You young people won't understand that, but there will be a day when you wake up and you go, what did I do yesterday? And it's like, no, you just slept on the wrong muscle. Our bodies are so perishable, but when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this again. What does the resurrection of Christ mean to you? Because you think about it. I want you to actually take time, if you can, either you know before you get to whatever meal you're going to have or maybe after, just, just kind of like sitting and digesting. What does the resurrection of Christ mean to you? Does it, do you believe it? Is it something that is compelling to you? Is it drawing you? Is it, is it beautiful to you? And here's, here's the beauty of this. We talked about what we lose if we lose the resurrection. Here's what we gain if we gain the resurrection. We gain atonement for our sins. We gain resurrection for ourselves, and we get to enjoy the, the time when Christ comes and makes all things new. 
what we gain is we gain true joy in Christ. The remedy for all of the brokenness that we're trying to mask in our lives by the things of this earth that will die away and be gone in the next hundred years for sure. All those things will be gone. But what we gain with the resurrection of Jesus is something that is eternal. It's promised, it's secured, and will bring you true joy. We gain a testimony. We've talked a lot about that in the past few weeks. Like Paul, we can walk through the beatings and the shipwrecks and the vipers, cars coming through the windshield, the face hitting the gravel, unexpected hospital visits, you name it. Kids acting a fool, not here this morning, but like all of the things in life that we go through that we, we might be tempted to put our hope on this thing happening just how we planned it. And then I'll be happy. Then I'll be satisfied. Then I'll be somebody. And when those things don't happen, you know what Christians can say? My hope is not in this thing. My hope is not in this thing. I, I expected this to fall apart because this life is perishable. But like Paul, we can have hope because the resurrected Savior has met with us and given us the promise of eternal life. The more as we go through Acts, the book of Acts, I've, I've just been struck. I think I've said this before. I've just been struck by how much the resurrection means to Paul. How often he references it. How often he is, he is laser focused on the resurrection. And that is the guarantee. That's what helps him walk through all the things he goes through. As, I'm sure as he's getting bit by the snake, he's like, oh, Jesus. I mean, not in a cussing way, but like <laughs> talking to him. I'm sorry. Like, Jesus, seriously? Like, I know because you're resurrected, this is not going to ultimately hurt me. Right now, it probably hurts. Right, but can you, like, just the confidence that he had. Because he had seen the resurrected Savior face to face. And that's a confidence that you and I can have because we trust in the word of God. If you're not a Christian here this morning, I don't assume that everyone here is a Christian. I want to say I'm glad you're here. I also want to let you know that this, this promises and this hope that I'm talking about has not been granted to you unless you have confessed and repented your sin and turned to trust in Christ. The promises that Christianity offers can only come through confession and repentance of sin and complete and total trust in the finished work of Jesus so that you might have atonement for your sin, that you might have eternal life, that you might be able to experience the complete resurrection. If you've not been transformed by the resurrected Savior, you are still dead in your trespasses and sins. And this is as good as it gets, folks. The good news is that because of the truth of the resurrection, you have a place to go with the brokenness in your life. You have a place to go with your sin. So I, we close. Is the risen Christ knocking at the door of your heart? Are, are, you, are you feeling the weight of the brokenness in your life and how often you've tried to seek satisfaction elsewhere? Do you feel and see the sting of death all around you? The evidence is all over the place. What diagnosis are you trusting? Let me implore you, don't put your trust in a hope that's for this life only. Don't do it. Don't put stock in anything that you can't take with you that doesn't follow you beyond the grave because it's just not worth it. Trust in the only one who has seen death, been in the grave, bore the weight of your sin, and rose to prove his victory so that you too can have victory and life everlasting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for your word, for the power that you've displayed 
and the resurrection. Lord, I thank you for the grace that you poured on us. I pray that your word would go forth from here this morning, that it would, would challenge us, Christians and non-Christians alike, or that Christians here would be challenged in, in what they're putting their hope in functionally, that we'd be more conformed to the image of Christ. And for Lord, if there are believe, non-believers here, those who have not quite yielded to you, Lord, I pray that you would quicken their hearts, convict them of their sin, and show them the beauty of the resurrection. Do that work in us, I pray in Jesus' name.